Why Beauty Matters. Most devious is beauty, cunning vine of the imagination, curled round the understanding. The more one tries to straighten it, the more it coils and chokes. A flower is beauty, the rose on the cross of existence, between heart and mind rooted, the idea thus appears. Art is important, not just because it is declared to be so, but because it is a fact of experience that it is so. Though art has a conceptual dimension which cannot be ignored, it is precisely in its peculiar conceptual sensuousness that art is most powerful and fit for its role in human life. Art is generally recognized in its uniqueness in connection with imagination, both as its source as well as for its recognition. However, art is no mere imagining. It is not just pure sensuality, but an intelligible sensuality. It has meaning, and it does not merely represent in abstraction, but presents in concreteness with the freedom of its idea shaping every aspect of its sensuous form. It has purpose, but this purpose is not external. It is internal to itself. Art, in its highest sense, is an end in itself and points towards nothing but itself. It does not intend to make us feel. It does not intend to make us learn or act. It does not intend to make us contemplate an abstraction behind or beyond it. Art shows a world of meaning even in its meaningless extremes. It is beautiful, and we desire nothing more of it. The importance and human need for art is beyond argument. Our own experience and history attest to this empirical fact. With this said, do we not wonder why beauty and art affect us so? Do we not then wonder what beauty and art as such are? The Stakes of Beauty Why is aesthetic such a touchy subject? Because, like politics and religion, to make any determinate judgment is to settle oneself on a side and make a wager for the high stakes not just of any truth claim, but of truth with a capital T, that ultimate judgment which we fear in being wrong, and therefore being false. If beauty is something other, and worse, opposite to what I comprehend or experience of beauty, I am not simply in error. I am error. Within me, the faculties which grasp the beautiful are apparently engaged when encountering the wrong stimulus. If I am such an error, however, what could I possibly do to save myself from that which I simply am? If I have bad taste, it is not simply a matter of learning what I ought to like, but of doing something that seems impossible, making myself like what I ought to like. These are the stakes of making explicit what beauty is and it at once is not. Because these stakes are so high, because the implication of wrong taste is that there is something wrong with those who make bad judgments of taste, in modernity we have by and large run away from the determination of beauty as objective. If beauty is subjective, it is truly not there for anyone but those who imagine it, and it is only as they imagine it and nothing more. No one can be wrong about it for the same reasons no one can be right about it. One beauty is as good as, and as bad as another, a fiction towards which there is no value to judge. In this manner, we may avoid the sin of judging someone unfit or lacking in something that seems so high and holy that none should be excluded. Yet it is the ultimate irony that in making beauty untouchable by the objective judgment, all that was successfully done was to exclude everyone from claiming they truly had encountered beauty. Regardless of how real it feels, how certain we are that it was what it was, neither we nor anyone else could rationally know that we encountered it and tell the world. On some common notions of art. It is common to think of the beautiful as a pleasure derived from the presence of sensuous objects, whether natural or made by intelligent hands. An object is beautiful because its sensuous appearance pleases us, yet we never seem to know why it pleases us since what is found beautiful comes down to a seeming arbitrary subjectivity, even on a mass scale. One person finds one thing beautiful, another finds no interest in it, and another finds it ugly. This also happens on a grand cultural scale and further complicates the question of why and how we find things beautiful. This comes from a confusion of attempting to conceptualize art based on the empirical derivation. If we try to unify any and all of what under common language is called beautiful, we shall find all manner of irreconcilable differences, oppositions, and contradictions. Beautiful things are not just pretty, but ugly, not just happy, but also sad, not just comforting, but disturbing and terrifying, not just sensuous, but also purely ideal, not just useful, but useless. The beautiful is sublime and utterly mundane. Everything and nothing is beautiful depending on who you ask. 
Math equations and concepts themselves are beautiful despite their lack of sensuous nature. Simplicity, complexity, completeness, and incompleteness are beautiful. There is in this case nothing intelligible to say of art other than that it is a relation of a kind of pleasure which only individuals know in feeling it, yet which they can never comprehend regarding what it is or why it arises in the kind of beings that we are. On the purely intelligible level, there appears to be no such thing as beauty or art, for there can be no determinate concept of it which may be given that captures all the empirical uses. Against an empirical derivation of art's concept, any a priori definition of art appears as merely posited arbitrarily. The great crime in the eyes of virtually everyone is that in any definition of art we shall find something which someone considers beautiful or artistic to be excluded from the honor of this title. It is most strange, however, that this high honor which art seems to have in the eyes of so-called artists and critics enjoys an equally low disdain in the general populace. What the so-called artistic world considers art and what the everyday person does is disconnected and often in complete opposition to each other. The artists and critics hate popular art for its shallowness, heartless production and repetition, while the masses by and large despise the artists for what they perceive as pretentiousness, nonsense masked by smoke and mirror explanations, a degenerate group of society propped by the rich who merely spend ridiculous amounts for the sake of status and investments for the future by buying up art with the equivalent of brand names. Despite this disdain for the art and artists of the rich, which is touted as the best of society, the average person does not disdain art as such. They too recognize the high honor of art, and they too resist any attempt to define out of art that which they create or consume. It is in order to save ourselves from being excluded from accessing this holy domain, beauty, that we have run away from giving any objectivity to art. We are people wandering in the desert, all seeking after an oasis called beauty, all certain that we have seen it, yet when asked exactly where we saw it and what it looked like, we find ourselves fumbling with words and directions, finally forced to conceive that though we believe we knelt and drank deeply from it, we may have simply suffered a mirage of personal projections of our unconscious. Vivid as the memory may be, we ourselves come to doubt whether such a thing ever existed, or if it was simply a delusion of our minds, for fear that we may contradict and call another's very being into question, and for doubt of our own experience's objective validity, since we lack an objective metric of knowledge, we simply offer a tale with no sense of certainty and no real hope of deliverance from our thirst. How could we dare to claim we know the beautiful, and are certain that others who claim to know it, in fact, had never even perceived it? The aim of coming to determine the idea of the beautiful is not to lord our knowledge as a social status over others. It is instead to be grasped as a way to come to comprehend how and why we experience beauty at all, under what conditions we come to experience certain kinds of beauty, and what beauty as such manifests in its ultimate striving as a realm of human expression in art. In this grasp we find a judgment, yes, but a judgment that does not look down upon anyone. To merely judge that someone has lack of taste and therefore has bad taste is almost like judging that children are stupid merely because they are not adults. One may say with full irony that such a judgment itself is in bad taste. It's pointless to argue about beauty with those who understand and experience otherwise than we, for part of beauty is the experiential dimension which will not be changed by a mere change in concept. That is, understanding is not enough to engage the aesthetic taste of individuals. It only formalizes the understanding of it. An inquiry into the nature of beauty and the nature of its judgment, therefore, cannot involve the raising of anyone to the standpoint of higher aesthetic taste any more than an inquiry into the nature of God can raise anyone to religious feeling for the divine. It is not, therefore, an argument against us that the conception we may come to offer does not raise in the reader any newfound feeling for things the prior found no beauty in. Second, the argument to be had is itself rather useless, because from the standpoint I inhabit, there is nothing to argue as to the falsity of beauty in any possible opponent's claims. I always readily conceive and accept that they truly perceive beauty, just not completely. Therefore my inquiry requires very little to be excluded as truly beautiful. In fact, one comes to realize that much that seems rather trivial shares validly in the realm of beauty. That is, everything is beautiful, just not to the same extent. Even the intensity of beauty which we experience with individual pieces and particular arts, an intensity which does not necessarily map the hierarchy or the possibility of art as form and content, finds a valid comprehension in the proper judgment of beauty.
The masterpieces of an age concern the depths of experience which they penetrate and the breadth of recognition which they genuinely achieve among a people. But even further, the truly great are so in overcoming even their own cultural audience and time, breaking forth into genuine universal recognition as eternal and omnipresent works to which we can relate. William Blake's great city of Golganuza is eternally present for all who seek. Hegel claims that art is one of the mirrors of the divine, the absolute, which exists through and also is our creative activity. Through art, spirit comes to know itself as itself and for itself. The human as kind, not as biological species, comes to appear in a way that it does not in its merely natural existence and appearance. This knowing for Hegel is generally known by many with an emphasis on intellectual comprehension. However, the process of artistic creation from the perspective of the artist requires a knowledge beyond the purely intellectual as theoretical, and further the perception of beauty is accompanied by an element of thought and feeling. The creation of art is itself a process of the realization of the ultimate reality, a mirroring process of its self-creation and self-determination, wherein the artist by experience comes to know the divinity of humans not simply as creator or contemplator of another thing, but as self-creating and self-contemplating. In the artwork, we can even rise to contemplate this truth of divine self-creation and self-determination. In such a way, the metaphysical aesthete comes to recognize all of existence as a masterwork of divine art where beauty is beginning and end. In art, humanity makes the absolute object in sensuous form and presents its essence in the subsumption of appearance, not according to the contingent and external mechanical, chemical, and biological laws of nature, but according to a concept. The beautiful is an appearance in accord with its essence, an essence which must appear in the individuality of the art piece. Art, it is clear from all human experience itself, connects to us in a way above and beyond the abstractly conceptual. It is intuitive or sensuous. It speaks to us not simply in the fact that it presents itself to the senses, but because this very sensuousness engages feeling. What philosophy and science offer to the conceptual mind in terms of coming to grips with its conscious and unconscious world and objective forms of rational self-determination, art offers equally to the feeling heart in terms with coming to grips with its conscious and unconscious inner world as an inner world of feeling and sensuous creation via the imagination. Though Hegel places philosophy above art, capable of making explicit more than what art can, this higher status of philosophy is a sublation which must take up art and its beauty along with it in its most concrete sense if it is to not be an abstraction. That is, philosophy's concepts must show themselves imminent to the sensuous world. Likewise, the sublation of the heart by the intellect of mind must take up the heart along with it, if it is to be a living knowledge and not a dead abstraction. Of what good an intellect without heart? The aesthete often proclaims, better a heart with no mind than a mind with no heart. With art, however, we attempt to find a unity of both, a feeling reason and a sensuous embodied concept. Our feeling becomes intelligible, and our intelligibility becomes felt. Reason is beautiful, and beauty at last appears rational. Yet the identity is not a collapse of one into the other. Beauty is a form of reason. That is, it is reason in sensuous form. In this, we must always remember that for Hegel, reason is not just the process of cognition in our minds, but the process of actual reality, undergoing a determinate process of becoming what it is. Matter is, in this sense, reason. Gravity is reason, chemistry, life forms, senses, feelings, and at its highest and purest form, mind is reason coming to existence as explicit reason for itself.